Um, welcome everybody to our parent session, to our parent learning session. And tonight we have Jessie Goldbeck. She is an instructional coach for Mountain View and she will share with us some techniques on how to help her students with reading skills at home. So uh, thank you, Jesse, for being here. And you can share your screen if that's what you want. Yep, that is, I will do that. Um, thank you, Minerva, for having me. Um, okay, I just got to figure out here. I just got to get the right screen. I'll put it over there. Okay, there we go. Okay. Do you see my email or do you, do you I see, see your, your presentation? Really oh, per perfect. Okay. So I am going to share, um, many ideas today. So again, um, my name is Jesse Goldback and I'm a reading specialist and instructional coach at Mountain View Elementary. I teach small group reading um, all day long. And right now I'm teaching small group reading on Zoom, which is very interesting, but um, that is my job all day is to teach students reading strategies. So I'm going to be sharing many reading strategies with you today, um, things that you can do at home. And um, I don't want it to be overwhelming. So if you just want to keep in mind things that maybe fit you, fit your family, fit um, your family's lifestyle. And some things might just be like, I don't get that. I'm not going to do that. And that's totally fine. Um, I just wanted to be sure that I had lots and lots of ideas. Um, so I will go ahead and get started. So I kind of divided it into, um, as I was thinking about what I wanted to share, there are some things that need to happen at all grade levels. And um, I am gonna go through each of these, but all students at all grade levels need to be chunking and blending, which I will explain. They all need fluency practice. They all need to be listening, um, have listening practice and retelling practice. Read alouds are fantastic for any grade level. Um, even middle school, junior high kids, they might try to be resistant at first, but um, if you and your child can find the right book, they will really enjoy that. Um, reading real world print, which I'll, I'll go into a little bit more, just talking, having conversations with your child. Um, and then nursery rhymes, fairy tales, myths, legends, idioms, and Bible stories. And so I will um, get into all of those. So these are for all grade levels. And um, I actually, because my experience is kindergarten through fourth grade, that's kind of how I geared my presentation. Um, but all of these things are good for all kids, actually, all through um, high schools. I'm thinking about my high school son. Um, he could use work in many of these areas. So the first thing is chunking and blending. So to explain what chunking and blending is, chunking is breaking a word apart into smaller parts. So um, into manageable pieces. So it could be sound by sound. It could be a compound word. So you're breaking it into the two words like rain, bow. It could be a large word, um, like, um, like if you took a word like blending, so you would break it into blend, ing, so taking off its ending. So it's breaking a word into syllables or sounds. Um, this is can be done auditorily, so um, just by listening. So you could. Um, play a game like um, like with compound words, rainbow, sunflower. Um, when kids are learning to read, they they break up a word sound by sound. So k, at would be cat. Um, so as the and that's called decoding when they're looking at print. But when you, they just need to be able to hear it at first, to hear all the different sounds. That's why talking to our kids is so important and having conversations 
because the very first thing that um, kids need to do is be able to hear sounds or hear syllables or hear chunks of word, um, chunks of a word. So chunking is breaking it apart and then blending would be putting it back together. So as students, um, I'm thinking like kinder first, as they start to read and sound out a word, they say k at. Um, sometimes they can't hear that that word says cat altogether. So if you um, start to blend words, you would start to hold your sounds. So you would say k at and try to hold it as long as you can. Um, and then the words cat. Or a better example would be um, sat, so you can hold an S for a long time, S at, sat. Um, so chunking, breaking apart, blending, put back together, it can be done with any, um, any size of words and with any grade level. So if you are a parent of older children, middle, junior, high school kids, think about all the, their vocabulary and all their big words that they have in their reading they still need to be able to chunk up those words um, to, to decode them, to read them. Okay, fluency practice. Fluency practice is really important. And it comes, um, so fluency is reading like you're talking or having a conversation. So I can read something without my brain really having to focus on the words too much. So as our kids get older, um, starting in about third grade, um, fourth grade for sure, the text complexity uh, increases dramatically. So especially in fourth grade, they're gonna have large words in their science, social studies, reading um, and math in their math vocabulary. And so history, I'm thinking about all of those things in um, the upper grades. So being able to have the skills that they need at a young age so that when they are um, older, they can just read without having to do too much thinking about what the word is. And the fluency happens when our brain just knows the word, when it's automatic. And we build fluency by reading the same story again and again, or the same paragraph or passage, whatever it is that the student is working on reading. And I know that that kind of seems like, oh, okay, um, you know, maybe that doesn't really work, but if you think about, I always try to tell the kids like a basketball player, they learn to have to shoot a ball um, like a free throw by doing a free throw over and over and over again. Um, a quarterback learns how to throw the ball by throwing the ball over and over and over again. So it's like muscle memory in sports. It's muscle memory for your brain to read the same thing over and over and over again. So when we have kids practice reading for fluency at school, um, we usually have them read it three times in one sitting, depending on how long, um, of course, the passage is. Um, so if fluency is necessary so that when we are reading, we can just, um, uh, our brain can be thinking about what is being said, what the content says, rather than um, breaking up the words and just trying to decode a word. When we're spending too much brain energy on chunking up a word, then um, we lose some of the comprehension, what the passage is actually trying to teach us or trying to tell us. So fluency, really important for all grades, all, all grade levels. Listening and retelling. Um, so listening comprehension is a precursor to reading comprehension. So that means if a student is able to listen to a story and understand it, if they can retell what happens, um, that needs to happen before that, they need to have that ability before they're gonna be able to read something and comprehend it. So um, read alouds at, at young age is especially important to build the listening, um, listening comprehension. It also builds stamina for focus. So we're listening to a story for a specific amount of time or you know, for the whole story or the whole book or the whole chapter, whatever it would be. So it's, we're, we're focusing and we're maintaining focus for um, a specific amount of time and not getting lost in the middle of the story and getting up and walking off. It also builds comprehension for details. So 
as they're listening to a story and they could be looking at the pictures if it's a book that has pictures. Um, of course, they can be looking at the pictures too, but they're listening for um, the details in the story and the things that are happening. It also builds vocabulary and language. So when um, they are listening to a story, they are hearing words that they might not be hearing in their everyday language or in their language um, within their home and um, vocabulary as well. And a lot of times, um, you know, we kind of get into the language and vocabulary that we use. Um, and if we're not exposed to other kinds of vocabulary and language, then, you know, we just kind of stay there. So it helps us all build our vocabulary. So then retelling, so they've listened to the story, now they're gonna retell the story. So it helps them build memory. So they're remembering everything that happened in the story and then organizing their thoughts. When we retell a story, we want, we would like them to start at the beginning, beginning, middle, end, and include all of the events and details as they happen. That's what we um, strive for. Um, it builds comprehension. So if, I'm, if I've heard a story, um, you know, many times I've heard some, somebody say something and then I've tried to repeat it to somebody. And then when I try to repeat it, I, I don't, like I've lost my comprehension. I, I didn't really understand it as well as I thought I did. So if we're able to retell it um, in a systematic way, then we do have an understanding of, of what we've heard. And then it also builds um, the student's oral language and fluency so that the student is learning to speak in a fluid way and uh, in a conversational way rather than getting stuck and stumbling all over their words, um, which we all do at times. Um, oh gosh, I had a thought. Oh, so um, retelling. So I try to, to tell the students when we're retelling a story, if, if sometimes I just get like one sentence, what, what was that? If I say, well, tell me what that story was about. And they say, it was about a starfish. And then that's all I get. So I ask, you know, I have to prompt and ask lots and lots of questions. So um, I try to say, well, if you had, if you watched a movie, you know, think about your child coming home and seeing a great movie and you hear the whole movie beginning to end. So we want them to retell like that, retell with all of the details beginning to end. Just like if they um, were to have seen a great movie or TV show. Um, read aloud. So this is when they are um, hearing somebody read to them, um, which builds their listening. But it also, um, this is just when we're reading for the enjoyment of reading. So it builds their fluency. Um, like, and I just said, it really ties into the listening, builds their fluency, their vocabulary, their comprehension. And it also builds that relationship with, um, with you or whoever is reading to them, because now you have a common bond and, or if you're reading a chapter book and you have to leave off, then you're both anticipating what's going to happen next. So it just builds a commonality between you and your child or between the person who's reading to them and themselves. Um, there are also great websites that have read alouds that you can um, go to for free. Um, so that's a great, also another great place for students to hear read alouds, but nothing's going to beat the, the relationship and the read aloud time and bonding time between you and your child. That, that far outweighs um, a computer for sure. So real world print is um, anything that you see outside, anything that you would see um, on the TV, on a cereal box, the store names. Um, literacy is all around us. Um, there are words and meaning all around us. So even um, street signs, symbols, all of those things, um, sh it shows that reading, uh, sh it has a purpose and it gives lots of opportunities to practice. And again, it builds our vocabulary, um, especially like street signs and um, uh, like words on cereal boxes. I don't, that just keeps coming into my mind. That's what I always would, uh, we would always read the cereal box, the back of the cereal box when I was young. Um, builds vocabulary because some of those words I would, I would not ever use in my own language. So, um, you know, just when you're out, when you're driving, reading signs, reading street signs, store names, 
anything like that. Reading the little um, brochures and handouts at the doctor's offices, all of those kind of things, real world prints. Um, so talking, talking um, is probably the very most important thing that you can do with your child and, and just talking and having a conversation about everything. Don't let them get away with saying, um, if you say, what'd you learn at school today? Nothing. Or did you have a good day? Yeah. Don't let them get away with that. Um, take the time to um, have a conversation while you're making dinner or while you're eating dinner. Um, and I, I know that it's busy and it's even crazier with um, the times that we're in right now, but um, talking is the most important thing you can do to build your child's vocabulary and which will help them with their reading skills. Um, it builds their conversational skills. So an actual conversation is it an exchange of, um, of, of five. So five comments or sentences need to um, go back and forth before it's actually considered a conversation. So keeping that in mind, like continue, continuing to prompt and ask open-ended questions rather than a yes or no kind of a question. It builds their oral language. Um, a lot of times kids will stumble over their words or they can't express what they mean. They can't say what they mean. Like the word is there. They know what they want to say, but they can't express it. So just having that practice of, um, of saying what they want to say. And then again, you're building relationships. You're getting to know each other more. Um, they can learn about you. You can learn about them. So all those kinds of things. Okay, um, nursery rhymes, fairy table, fairy tales, myths, legends, idioms, and Bible stories. So I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly. I included these because these are all different types um, of reading materials that are important for kids to know. Um, please do not be overwhelmed and think that I am asking you to go out and find all of these kinds of um, stories to read um, this school year. I mean, choose one that might be interesting to you and fit your child's age and, um, you know, find some stories from that. You can find lots of these kind of stories online too, for free, or there's lots of books, um, also. So nursery rhyme is what we think of like Humpty Dumpty or Twinkle Twinkle, Old MacDonald, Itsy Bitsy Spider. So it's a traditional song or poem so these are things that we um, just want to practice with our young children. It um, really builds rhyming, which is so, 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 so important. Um, it just allows them to hear that sing song voice, that fluency in their voice. Um, and they're fun. And in, when I have students in a um, small group and we do nursery rhymes with, my, with the kindergartners, I just make up hand motions and they think it's the greatest thing that ever was. So if you have little ones like kindergarten, uh, maybe first grade, kindergarten and younger, you can, um, you can get away with nursery rhymes, um, kind of sing it, make it silly. There's a million of them out there. Um, so have fun with nursery rhymes. Fairy tales. Fairy tales are stories that um, have a good versus evil or contains magic. So most often I think of like the Disney princess stories but there's other ones. Um, so Snow White is one of the princess ones. Hansel and Gretel, Cinderella, the elves and the shoemaker. And one reason why the um, fairy tales, tales are important. So they're very engaging to students. Um, you can argue that it teaches a lesson between good versus evil and good um, almost always prevails. But more importantly than that, fairy tales are referenced in our everyday language um, or just everyday conversations. And if they aren't familiar with um, the most common fairy tales, then um, they might not understand the reference. For example, um, somebody might say, well, that's a real Cinderella story, um, talking of a girl who, um, you know, like a poor girl who married rich or a poor girl who really made her way in the world or something like that. Um, the elves and the shoemaker, um, when the, you know, the, something 
just popped up. You don't know where it came from. Oh, the elves must have done that. Um, Hansel and Gretel, where the witch um, builds them a little fire, or their parents build them a little fire out in the woods. So it's just, um, they're commonly referenced in everyday um, language. And so um, we have it just as a background knowledge, just so they're familiar with those kinds of stories. Um, Mulan is one that's coming to mind that could be um, referenced a lot. It seems like Mulan comes up a lot in my life or people reference the Mulan, Mulan, they'll say, oh, you know, like Mulan. Um, so just so they have that background knowledge. I hope that makes sense. Um, myths. So myths are traditional stories from early history, and they usually involve a supernatural event or people. So in all of these things that um, I'm going to be explaining in the next in the next couple ones, myth, legends, and Bible stories. So I'm not asking that you um, uh, read these with your child and teach them to believe it as truth. Um, a, a myth is a myth and it's a traditional story. Um, some people would argue that it's true, some people not, but the story is out there and they are often, um, Greek myths are often referenced in language and literature. So Medusa, the lady with all the snakes on her head, Hercules, um, who was very, very strong. Cyclops, Cyclops um, occurs a lot in literature um, or in stories or in movies, Cyclops. So the, um, the being that has one eye in the middle of his head and um, Pandora's box, which I thought um, is interesting. So Pandora's box is when uh, Pan um, she was told not to um, open the box, but she does. And then she lets all the evil out. So um, that teaches a lesson also, you know, you need to do what you're told kind of a thing. So I'm not asking um, that you, you would read these um, or explore them and, and believe them. I'm just asking, um, I'm just saying that to read them, you know, they're out there, they are historical stories and um, they are interesting. They can be interesting. Um, legends um, are, Traditional stories, usually about something in history, but they're unproven. And so legends are, are actually really fun. So um, the Fountain of Youth, which um, Ponce de Leon found in um, Florida, supposedly. And so then you can go drink from the Fountain of Youth and be young forever. Paul Bunyan, who was a giant, strong guy, uh, man, sorry, giant, strong man. And he had his blue ox and he was a lumberjack. And then Robin Hood, so um, stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. All, all of these, again, um, are kind of um, things that um, are referenced in, um, in literature or, you know, they come up um, throughout our lives. And so just having a familiarity with the story. Another one would be Johnny Appleseed. Um, again, I'm not asking you to... Uh, read them as truth, but read them as just what they are. If they're a legend, that's, it's not proven. Um, so idioms, idioms are something that um, actually have been very interesting to me lately. So idioms are a group of words that have a meaning that is different than what the words actually mean. So an example, beat around the bush. If you tell somebody don't beat around the bush, um, it's not literally telling them to not beat around a bush or pulling my leg don't or um, stop pulling my leg um, butter me up oh you're just buttering me up or letting the cat out of the bag so these um, idioms don't mean exactly what those words mean but they have an, an alternate meaning so what I have been doing lately um, with my family um, is I'm finding the origins of idioms, and then uh, we read them together. And so, um, no, my children are not like as excited about it as I am, but we still read it. It's just a short little thing that says where it came from. And then, you know, now they have that background knowledge, whether they realize it or not. So I printed off a couple beating around the bush 
um, means that it's taking somebody a long time to get to the point of what they're saying. They're kind of going around what they're saying. They don't really want to say what they're saying. Um, so when you're saying don't beat around the bush, you're saying, you know, get to the point. What do you say? So the origin of this is um, from medieval times, actually, when the hunters would hire a person, a man, to um, beat a stick to flush out the, the birds. And the hunter or the person with a stick would beat around the bush instead of beating the bush, instead of hitting the bush, they would beat the ground around it to try to scare out the animal. Because if they hit the bush, there could be a dangerous animal in there, such as like a, a wild boar that could come out and hurt them, but they didn't obviously want to get hurt. So they would hit around the bush and then the hunter would be get impatient and say, stop beating around the bush, meaning they wanted them to hit the bush, like get on with it, get to the point. So hitting the bush and then the birds would flush out or the rabbits or squirrels would, um, would flush out. So something that I, I have learned what um, beating around the bush meant. And then um, butter me up. So butter me up comes, the origin is from ancient India. And people used to take little blobs of butter and throw it on the statues of various gods when they were asking the gods for favors. So, um, and in, um, this says in Tibet, they would sculpt, um, they would craft sculptures of the gods out of butter. So it's um, an honor. So butter me up means that you are giving me lots of compliments and flattering me. So don't, don't, oh, you're just buttering me up. You're just, um, you know, trying to make me good. So um, it seems funny to me that people would throw little balls of butter on statues, but that's what they did. So I just found those online. Um, so that's what I've been doing with my family and my kids. So um, I have been learning a lot and I find it to be very interesting. And then they get to hear the information also. So those are kind of fun. And these are just four idioms. There's a million out there. And some of them have really good explanations and some of them don't. So you can kind of look around for those. Let me check my time. Okay. Um, Bible stories. Again, um, I, I'm not saying this as I think um, I'm saying uh, read the Bible and believe it as truth if that is not what your family believes. But stories like this are um, often referenced in literature or everyday life. Um, so David and Goliath, when David's a small boy, Goliath is a huge giant and he kills him with one stone. Um, so that type of a story with the underdog killing a giant occurs often. Um, Adam and Eve, when they ate the forbidden fruit, so the forbidden fruit comes up often. So having a point of reference, knowing where that came from, um, is important for our background knowledge, for the students' background knowledge. Okay, specifically to kinder and first grade. So this is specifically to really, um, to younger beginning readers. Um, phonological awareness. Um, Phonological awareness is just listening. So I tell my students that it's a job for their ears. So a lot of times we close our eyes. So you don't have to have a book. You don't have to have letters. You, you don't have to have anything. So you can do this when you're just talking with them. You are, um, things like rhyming, just rhyming. You can rhyme real words, nonsense words, but the ability to hear rhyme as a young person is really important. Um, so rhyme things with their name, rhyme things with your name, rhyme things with the siblings' names, rhyme things with things you see outside. Just, it, just getting them to automatically hear rhyme is really important. Um, again, chunking compound words like sun, flower, cup, cake, that they can hear that there's two words. Segmenting syllables, traf, ik, com, cuter, um, so we can, you can clap out sounds, you can do it with your chin. They don't have to hear, uh, I'm sorry, they don't have to read these words, 
they're just doing it by listening. So if you said traffic and then traffic and did that kind of an activity with them. And then naming words that all begin with the same, with whatever. So all, how many words can you think of that begin with a B? Baby, balloon, ball, bun, and then just list all kinds of words. It's just getting them to listen for those sounds, have the ability to listen for those sounds. Um, specifically for second grade, um, blending, so putting chunks back together, starting to use blending while um, combined with phonics. So using their phonological listening skills along with seeing the print. Um, that's for kinder and first as well because they're starting to read, but that is specifically a second grade um, second grade skill when they're really beginning to decode and read um, more text. Um, but, oh yeah, that's just what I have there. Blending allows students to decode unfamiliar familiar text. And then blending also builds fluency and automaticity. So if they have learned to decode, if they're decoding the word blend and they say b, l, e, n, d, Sometimes their brain can't pick up all of those sounds again from the beginning to the end. So when they're blending, if they can hold their sounds, blend, blend, and then they can, it's easier for their brain to um, hold all of the sounds rather than hear them in individual segments. Again, reading and retelling, it's so important. Um, their retelling builds their comprehension. So second graders, are usually reading um, quite a bit at, um, in second grade and compared you know, to what they have been in kinder and first. And so just really thinking about what they're reading. So I always ask my students to please pay attention to yourself when you are reading. You're reading so that you can understand. That's the only reason we read is to understand what we've read. There's no other reason to do it. Pay attention to yourself so then you can understand it and retell it to somebody else. Um, and the retelling is how we know that they understand what they've read. It also allows them to organize their thoughts, beginning, middle, end with all the details, which will assist them in writing um, in the future. Specifically to third and fourth, and then this could go on um, clear up for big kids too. So if you're the parent of bigger kids, this is for you, reading multi-syllabic words. So we call them big words um, instead of multi-syllabic. So multi-syllabic words are just any word with more than one um, syllable. They, these are the words that they're gonna get in, starting in third grade, but really heavy in fourth grade. And they're really um, strong, heavy in content areas. So math, science, social studies, and history. It's, um, this is what all, almost all of our content vocabulary, big, big words. And there are a lot of similarities with multisyllabic words that they have a base word um, and then prefixes and suffixes. So for example, like preheat, um, Heat is the base word. And then I can preheat, I can reheat, heat in, preheat in, reheated. Um, and then helpful, I can be helpful, helpless, helpfulness. Um, so there, there is a similarity. So um, just helping them identify chunks of words that they recognize, which we do, we work on very hard in, um, in my reading groups. And then, um, then their brain just has to work that less, that much less on those chunks, and they can uh, focus on the other parts of the word that they don't know. Um, yeah, okay, so this could be done um, orally also, if you, if you have, um, if you can think of, my problem is I can't ever think of the words when I want them, but if you can think of multi-syllabic words or big words and then like clap out the syllables or you know anything like that. 
but you'll find plenty of them in um, their text starting third grade all the way up for sure. Um, vocabulary, so this is the same thing, third grade all the way up. So their vocabulary is more complex as the text becomes more complex. And again, it's found in all their content. Um, so an activity that you could do is if this child, I'm, I'm picturing a, a student doing homework and they come to a word that they don't know. So I gave an example here. So vulvox is a word that is actually in fourth grade science. So the text says the somatic cells of a vulvox colony each feature two flagella. So there are many words in that sentence that I don't know. And um, that would be a fourth grade sentence. So you look up the word. So I, I'm look, I chose to look up the word vulvox. So the definition of vulvox is chlorophyta, green algae in the family of vulvacae. They live in a variety of freshwater habitats. So I had my sentence from my text. I looked up the definition. There's still words that I didn't understand in the definition, but I do understand algae, green algae, and freshwater habitats. So I'm going to explain now what a volvox is in my own words. So a volvox is a kind of algae that lives in a colony in a pond or river. So taking the word and then um, looking it up and then re-explaining what the word is in your own language so that it can you can um, just get that to be a more concrete um, thought in your mind. If I tried to repeat that definition, I would not, I can't even pronounce some of the words in the definition. So I'm going to, I re-explain it in my own words and I know that Volvox is a kind of green algae and it lives in fresh water. So it will take time to look up words from vocabulary, or vocabulary words from students' um, assignments and textbooks, but it is so worth it so that they have a real understanding. You can easily Google um, definitions on your phone. I Google definitions um, a lot, a, a couple times a week at least. And that's just for myself, um, just so that I know what words mean. So vocabulary is, um, is a big one, especially for the big kids. Um, okay, so if your students are going to watch TV, which they are, and so again, um, I apologize if you have older children. Um, my mind was thinking younger, um, but if they're going to watch TV, which they are, we all know that, um, then choose shows that teach vocabulary. So PBS is great, um, a great place to watch educational shows. Um, Word Girl, Martha Speaks. Wild Kratz, and then the, the Electric Company, which is on YouTube. It's not on PBS anymore. Um, my daughter is a sophomore in college. And when she was in, and my son is a junior in high school. When my kids were little, um, they watched PBS because we didn't have cable or anything. So really that's the only thing they could watch. And they still to this day will tell me um, vocabulary words that they learned from these shows. So when I was making this presentation, I texted them and asked them, what were the shows that you guys watched for all the vocabulary? And um, so my daughter said, Word Girl, Martha Speaks is good, but Word Girl's better is what she said. And they still, to the, to, they'll tell me all kinds of vocabulary words that they learned and the animal facts from Wild Kratz. And I know kids are watching Wild Kratz because um, they come and tell me stuff about animals all the time at school. I say, where did, how do you know that? Oh, Wild Kratz. So um, that's good that they're getting that from um, those kind of shows. So I know that I have talked for a long time and I've given you a ton of information. Um, I really hope that you got something that is useful for you and for your family and um, for your child's age. So if you, remember nothing else from anything that I have said. Um, please remember to read to and talk to your kids. That's the two single most important things. And I know that it seems simple 
and it might seem like too easy, um, it's the best thing you can do to build your child's language. Um, it's also hard to find time to do those kind of things, but please make the time for it um, and your kids will really benefit. My goodness, Jesse, I loved it. I oh, good. I was, you know, those idioms you were talking about, I was like, what is she talking about? I have never heard those. And so my husband was having dinner right here next to me. And I was like, what is she? And she, he was giving me examples. This was super oh. cool. This was wonderful. And yes, those are part of the language. Those right. are part of the language. Yes. Especially for our, um, for second language learners, um, because I don't think that those are in all cultures. I don't know if all cultures have adopted idioms. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a very fun way to learn about idioms. Let's let's look about the history. Yeah, I appreciate your time and your prepping all these work. And yeah. we will be looking forward to seeing you on Thursday with our Spanish speaking families. And okay. all those families that we had a good group of people, but then they started logging out because of time. But we had a good group of people. Thank you for being here. We're going to post this on the website too for, for the rest of the families to enjoy. And it was a pleasure having you here, Jesse. Thank you.